Thanks, uh, Geeks. I hope I'm audible to everyone. <coughs> um, all right. So it's good to be back uh, at WSOCon after uh, six years, I think. It's always good to talk in person and have face-to-face -face discussions. Uh, so WSOCon brings back a lot of fond memories. Uh, and it's interesting how long, uh, how far the product has come uh, from six years back and uh, how interesting and advanced the use cases our customers are implementing with our product has got. Um, <clears throat> so w one such interesting um, area in IAM is uh, B2B CIM, which is, of course, my topic today. Um, so let's uh, dive into that. So what is B2B CIM? Um, so if you are a company who is building um, SaaS applications for your enterprise customers or partners, I think almost all companies would have some SaaS application, uh, then you require B2B CIM, right? So if you are building such applications, you need to, uh, you need to have an IAM backbone to onboard uh, and manage identities and provide secure access to your um, services and resources, right? So you need uh, B2B CIM. And um, a B2B CIM solution can make this, uh, make uh, SaaS application development easier for you and your developers, right? So that's what um, the B2B CIM solution offers. So <clears throat> even the analysts, uh, the most famous analyst Gartner has also recognized B2B CIM as an up-and-coming trend in identity and access management. Um, so um, they, they, they've, uh, they've mentioned to us that in the recent inquiries, the top most inquired uh, topic has been B2B CIM. And there is only about one-third of IAM vendors who are providing uh, out-of-the-box solutions for B2B CIM problems. So at WSO2, we are very happy that uh, we are one such vendor who is ahead of uh, some of the other vendors in the market, and we uh, want to try and stay ahead of the game. Right? OK, so if you're building a, a B2B SaaS application, regardless of what industry or regardless of the size of your company, these are some of the common challenges you would find, right? And your developers would find. So first and foremost, uh, you need to onboard your customers and partners, um, or you can call them as organizations. So organization onboarding is a unique thing to B2B CIM. You don't have that in uh, consumer-facing IAM or employee-facing IAM, right? So you need to have processes and very intuitive APIs and workflows in order to onboard organizations. So that's the first challenge. Secondly, you need to reduce the friction in customer access. So in B2B CIM, you, are, you may be dealing with thousands of organizations and thousands, hundreds to thousands of identities within those organizations. So easily, you can cross around a million identities. And you don't have uh, proximity, you know, close proximity to these identities. These are like uh, customers of, I mean, users of your customers or customers of your customers, right? So you don't have a direct relationship with them. So it's best to get your customers or partners to manage those identities, right? So in a more self-service manner. So you need to enable self-service, right? So that's uh, reducing friction. And there are organizations who go to market in various ways. So you can directly sell um, soft, uh, I mean, your solutions, products and solutions to your customers. Or you may be uh, taking a different uh, route by selling through intermediaries like resellers, uh, distributors, so on and so forth, right? So these resellers and distributors also are considered organizations, right? And they also may need to be uh, modeled and represented in your organization management hierarchy, right? So that's another unique requirement you could have. And then um, you need to appoint certain users within your organization or maybe an intermediary as a custodian for one or more customers, right? So this is part of the delegated administration 
where uh, a user or an intermediary becomes the custodian for a set of customers so that they can manage um, uh, different uh, attributes of that customer. Right? Um, then number five is regulatory compliance. So you're dealing with external identities, right? And um, so it's very important that you need to take all measures to reduce or mitigate uh, the, the level of fraud that can happen. And because this is external identities, you need to make sure you're uh, complying with all the privacy regulations uh, that are there. Uh, and number six is reducing operational costs. So this also goes hand in hand with self-service. So for example, if you, if you, are, if you operate a kind of a help desk um, for your customers, uh, your costs could go up, right? So as much as possible, you want to provide self-service to your customers so that they can um, take care of their day-to-day -day identity and access management needs by themselves and rarely have to get in touch with you to sort out their IAM problems. And finally, as with any other segment of IAM, you need to empower your developers by providing the right tools uh, so that they can uh, easily build their B2B SaaS applications and do the IAM plumbing uh, very fast. And also, if they run into any issues, they can troubleshoot and recover quickly. So these are some common challenges that we see uh, um, when organizations are building B2B SaaS applications. So now let us look at, let us look at uh, what are the foundational capabilities that makes B2B SaaS applications unique and successful. Uh, in the market. So at WSO2, we believe that these capabilities can be categorized based on the stakeholders that a B2B, SaaS B2B CIM solution needs to satisfy, right? So the, these are the three most important stakeholders. So if you were uh, present in the talk in the morning, uh, the keynote talk by Sanjeeva, uh, he explained the importance of uh, you know, providing the right level of experience for your developers so that they are more productive and, uh, you know, they are more uh, efficient at what they do, right? So empowering developers is number one. Enhancing customer experiences. So in B2B, we are talking about your external uh, users. These can be your customers and partners. So we need to make sure they have a very delightful experience. And third is making sure um, your internal stakeholders, such as your uh, digital, uh, such as your internal teams who have digital processes, uh, they are happy uh, because their digital processes have been optimized and improved, right? So let's look at the various capabilities under each of these categories. So number one is empowering developers. You need to make sure that your developers are productive and efficient in building B2B SaaS applications, right? So uh, if you look at the market today, the IAM market, there are two camps of IAM vendors. Uh, one camp of IAM vendors provide what we call an application-centric IAM development experience, right? So if you go to develop an application or configure an application in this, these kind of solutions, um, you, you get an application perspective and when you create objects like users, groups, roles, or policies, et cetera, all those are created within that, uh, the, the, the perspective of that application. So if you have a suite of applications, then you need to uh, duplicate these objects across these applications, which means you may not get a unified development experience, and also there is data duplication, as well as you don't get a single sign-on experience. So there are a number of uh, vendors today, especially the new breed of vendors who are taking this kind of approach, which is not going to be very successful when you have large number of applications. The other camp is what we call an organization-centric approach, which recognizes that there are objects that can be shared across applications, so they can create these objects at an organization level, and there can be certain objects created at an application level uh, as well, right? So this kind of provides a more unified experience for the developers as well as an SSO experience for your consumers. 
So WSO2, of course, follows the organization-centric uh, experience. Then in um, B2B CIM, the most important thing is being able to create a tenant or an isolated space for each of your customer or partner, right? And um, so in the most simplest uh, B2B CIM case, you would create uh, tenants, a, a single level of tenants for your customers and partners, right? But there can be more advanced use cases where your customer might have uh, substructures within the organizations. So these can be like regional um, um, you know, uh, offices or business units under them, where they may have a global um, kind of IT operation where the um, policies and things like that are governed globally, but the management might be done at a uh, sub-organization or regional level, right? So that kind of structure you should be able to model. So the, w, the, the B2B CM solution should make it easy to model these kind of structures uh, without having to write much of code. Another scenario is where I was talking about the resellers. So there can be resellers as intermediaries and then resellers can onboard a, uh, customers under them and they would also have certain uh, privileges to manage these customers. Uh, in the same central CIM platform. So all these users are part of the CIM platform, but then you have this kind of hierarchical relationship based on how they were onboarded. So then next uh, requirement is mandatory access delegation. So if a, a good uh, example scenario for this would be, as I said, um, if you need to appoint a, a certain user, uh, or a certain intermediary uh, responsible to manage certain um, attributes, properties in your, uh, in, in your, within your custom organization, you can use this kind of approach, right? Um, so um, let's say, for example, if, if you're running a, a, a support desk operation, then, for example, a, a support team member may be assigned uh, responsible for certain organizations to manage or troubleshoot certain organizations. So this can be facilitated out of the box. Imagine uh, or, or if you're a business who is uh, providing a platform um, for B2B uh, organizations to interact with each other, then you can consider that as a B2B ecosystem. So in the most general sense, I have drawn this diagram. Um, in, a, in a B2B ecosystem, at any given point in time, there is an organization that is uh, owning some resources and providing share, sharing those resources. And then at the same time, there are organizations that are consuming these resources. Right? So then in order to consume these resources, there are some access control policies that need to be implemented based on which these consuming organizations get access to different resources. So to make it clear, I'll give you a, a real world example based on, based on one of our existing customers. So we have a customer who is in the telco space and they manufacture um, uh, equipment for telco infrastructures and uh, networks like monitoring devices, et cetera. So, and they sell it to uh, telcos, right? So their customers are telcos. And then they also partner up with these um, smaller uh, companies. Uh, they basically subcontract uh, to take care of the maintenance and you know periodical maintenance, uh, you know part replacements, software upgrades, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if there is a so and they provide this B two B platform, right? So if there is a um, upcoming maintenance or if there is a part replacement or something like that. The, provider, the, the, the customer, the telco, can go to this platform and create a job, right? And then the, uh, the subcontractor who is responsible uh, for that region or something like that uh, could go and pick this job and attend to the job and then, um, you know, uh, complete the task, right? So this kind of collaboration is enabled in this B2B platform. So, you, you can, I think, um, um, extend this use case to various industries, but I think you get the point, right? Uh, so this is what we call a B2B ecosystem. 
So then, uh, uh, for developers, we need to provide the tooling, which I already spoke about. So we need to provide visual editors, low-code editors, you know, out-of-the-box workflows, templated integrations, etc. So they are more productive. So the second segment of um, stakeholders is your um, customers or partners, right? So you need to provide flexibility as well as autonomy uh, so that they are happy, right? So let's look at what are the capabilities you expect uh, for your customers and partners. So as I explained before, first and foremost, you need delegated user management or user lifecycle management. So as the platform administrator, it's uh, not scalable and not practical to manage identity lifecycle for you know, millions of users. So what you do is you delegate your user management privileges to the customer admins or the partner admins, right? So they do it for their companies. So that's number one, right? As well as if they have uh, the substructures I was talking about, they can onboard their own substructures as well, right? So you don't have to onboard that. They can take care of their uh, user onboarding and sub-organization onboarding. So then you can delegate entitlement management as well, right? So your customer admins knows best which user gets which role and needs to access what resources. So they can do the en delegated entitlement management as well. So typically that will be delegated to like a team lead or something like that who will take care of the entitlements for his team members. Then we looked at mandatory access delegation. Then we have discretionary access delegation. So in discretionary access delegation, you can invite users uh, to access your organizations or access certain parts of your application. So this is typically done through invitations, email invitations, etc. So again, this can be depending on the use case. It could be a support desk. And if you have some issue, you can invite the support user with your consent he can uh, log into your uh, organization or parts of your application and access uh, and, and kind of troubleshoot or do certain things on behalf of you, and everything could be audited properly, right? So that's discretionary access delegation. Then we have B2B collaboration. There are, there are use cases where uh, users from two different organizations need to collaborate with each other. Right? So a good example, uh, a real-world example is, of course, uh, Google Docs, right? or, or uh, sharing Docs on Microsoft OneDrive. Right? So two different organizations who are customers of Google Workspace or, or my Microsoft can share Docs with each other. These are, these are Docs shared with external organizations I'm talking about, not within the same organization, but external organizations. So that is kind of a collaboration that is enabled in the Google Workspace platform. Likewise, if you are in your company also, if you have uh, such a requirement, uh, the, the, the B2B collaboration feature can al uh, allow you or can facilitate this kind of collaboration by uh, easily um, inviting and providing the right uh, entitlements in order to access these resources. Right? So this may not be the primary uh, functionality of the platform, but this may be a um, kind of an optional feature that may enhance your customer experience, right? Then uh, you, you should be able to provide a variety of login options for your customers, right? Uh, so your standard login may be username password, but you may have customers who want to uh, plug in their enterprise SSO so that they get single sign-on uh, across your application as well as their internal applications, right? Uh, there may be other customers who are already using FIDO or biometric app, uh, authentication or pass keys, so they may want to add that as a MFA option so that the access to your application is more secure, right? So this variety of authentication options need to be provided, um, but, but still, uh, you need to uh, be able to govern, the platform needs to be able to govern the um, level of assurance that's required for each of these applications. And then branding, again, like uh, the authentication options, branding also should be self-service. So your customer or partner should be able to decide what is the kind of branding they need for their organization. So there will be a default branding that is provided at the platform level, but 
customers can apply their own branding for their users so that when their users log into your application, they feel like this is a, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, application that is brand that, that is owned by their company, or it feels like their company application, right? So all those are all, all these features we looked at the uh, under the customer experience category are self-service, right? The customers themselves can do do those, and they don't need to contact the platform administrator. So finally, we come to uh, what you can do for your internal. Uh, uh, processes, right? How you can improve internal processes in order to streamline and govern uh, access to external uh, users. So when it comes to CIM projects, integration is a very vital part, right? Uh, all successful CIM projects have an integration backbone, and a very good example is the uh, from our uh, customer portfolio is the the Hard Rock project we had. Right? Um, so uh, CM uh, products need to integrate with a variety of business systems, from CRM systems, subscription services, marketing automation, and CDPs, et cetera, depending on the requirement. Right? Uh, so uh, in this case, I have taken uh, an example uh, uh, based on custom onboarding. Right? So what are the different kinds of integrations you, you may need uh, based on your customer onboarding scenario? Right? So if you are doing a sales-led onboarding, right, typically an account manager would go to your CRM solution and then create, uh, enter the details of the organization and do what we call a sales-led onboarding, uh, which, uh, which in turn the CRM application will call your CRM solution and trigger an uh, organization onboarding process, right? And it will send out an email to the customer's admin and the customer admin can log in and onboard uh, their organization and onboard their users, right? Um, on the other hand, if you have a product-led onboarding or, or a self-service onboarding, then the customers would come to your product website and they would do a self-registration, which would basically call uh, a, a CIM API in the back end, the registration API, and that could in turn kick off the same kind of workflow uh, with the CRM system, right? So this time it's the uh, CRM system that needs to call the CRM system. And we talked about how um, third parties or brokers can onboard customers. So it's the same, it, it, it should end up in the same state. So basically these brokers will have their own applications, which we call third party clients, which will call your registration APIs, and that will uh, kick off the process in the CRM system and that will onboard the customer. See, these are all various custom onboarding scenarios that need various you know, points of integrations. And then as a, um, platform, as a, as a platform provider, the, where you provide multiple applications, you need to be able to govern which customer requires uh, access to which applications, right? So depending on the level of subscription the customer has, or depending uh, on the level, on the, on the tier loyalty or something like that, depending on, on, on the, the, that uh, subscription, certain customers may be able to access certain applications, but might not be able to access certain other applications. And enabling and disabling, uh, or allowing and disallowing access to these applications are like a, a click of a switch, right? So the, the CIM platform makes it so easy to turn on and off the uh, access, right? You don't need to go and uh, configure or code uh, these things. And last but not least, uh, as a B2B, uh, B2B uh, platform, you need to uh, be able to see all kinds of accesses uh, by all organization users across all your applications in these kind of uh, dashboards, right? And also be able to audit all kinds of accesses. And it's not just you, but also there may be cases your customers might want to see uh, these audit trails uh, of you know, who are the users who are accessing uh, resources of the organizations, as well as uh, you know, uh, what are the applications that are being most used by their users. So your customers also might want access to these dashboards. So the CM solution provides these dashboards out of the box, so you don't have to really build these by yourself. Yeah, so that almost brings me to the end of my talk. And um, 
in the, in this last part we'll just look at you know where this b2b uh, cm fits in so wso2 iam uh, is is a we, we position ourselves as an access management vendor uh, so we are a one stop shop uh, to do access management across all your segments of users from b2c b2b b2e and apis and of course we integrate well with other um, um, components in the IEM landscape like IGA, PAM, and WAM. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's it. Uh, I'll leave you there. And 